praised be Jesus Christ now and forever. Hello, I'd like to begin with a prayer today. This is from our Byzantine tradition. Uh, this is for the feast of, of the Venerable Father Francis of Assisi, and it is the Troparian of the Hierodeacon, uh, because he was a deacon in his church, in the church, and the Kentuckian of St. Francis. <clears throat> In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In you, O Father Francis, has been preserved without defect the image of Christ our God. Having shown us the poverty of Christ, you have not left us orphaned in your death. Pray without ceasing for us all. And it continues, you are a Catholic man, an apostle of Christ church, a holy Francis, beloved of Christ God. By your example, you taught us to honor the priests of the Lord. You love the cross of Christ exceedingly and asked to be praised in it alone. Therefore was the world crucified to you and you to the world. By your prayers then, deign that we too may stand at the right side of God on the day of judgment. Holy Father Francis, pray for us in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, hello, my brothers and sisters in Christ and our Holy Father Francis and Holy Mother Claire. My name is Father Daniel Dozier, and I'm a Byzantine Catholic priest in the Pacific Northwest. I'm a pastor and also a chaplain administrator for the first Catholic Marian shrine in Washington State, which is dedicated to Our Lady of Perpetual Help, uh, with a mosaic icon blessed personally by Pope St. John Paul II, whose feast day we just recently celebrated. I'm also an associate professor of sacred scripture at our Byzantine Catholic Seminary in Pittsburgh, and an academic associate in Catholic leadership at Franciscan University, and most importantly, a husband, a father, and a grandfather. I've also been a professed Franciscan tertiary for 23 years <clears throat> and a former minister of formation for my OFS fraternity. Uh, today, I'm delighted to be a part of the wonderful Third Order of St. Francis, or TOF, as an isolated tertiary, although I hope someday, God willing, that uh, not to be that I won't be so quite so isolated and can have a, uh, a wonderful TOF fraternity, perhaps under the holy patronage of our Mother of Perpetual Help. Although I'm saddened that I can't be with all of you today personally due to obligations at my parish, I'm delighted to be able to address you today in this important gathering of those who seek to be faithful in our following of Jesus Christ in the footsteps of St. Francis as penitents and tertiaries. And my talk today is entitled, Troubadours of the King, the Gospel, the Kingdom, and Franciscan Renewal. Now, we know from our history that the term troubadour was the name that St. Francis and his young companions in the city of Assisi used to describe themselves prior to his conversion. This movement of the troubadours came to great prominence beginning in southern France and then moving to Italy around the 12th century, and troubadours were traveling lyricists and musicians who would compose and perform musical poetry focused especially on the themes and tales of chivalry, love, and romance. And it's noteworthy that uh, his love of poetry and singing, especially in French, the native language of his mother Pika, was mentioned by his early biographers. So Thomas of Chilano notes, uh, quote, the sweetest melody would bubble up in him and he would give exterior expression to it in French, end quote. Uh, St. Bonaventure also mentions on one occasion regarding music that Francis felt such pleasure at the wonderful melody that he often felt he had left this world, that there's something transcendent about, uh, about song for St. Francis. <clears throat> and this is repeated in the 14th century anthology, The Mirror of Perfection, quote, for the sweetest of spiritual memories would often well up within him and find expression in French melodies, end quote. And then finally, the legend of the three companions recounts, and Francis in a loud, clear voice sang the praises of God in French. So as an aside, his love of the poetic and the lyrical as an expression of his spirit and his theology, which afterwards became typical in Umbria, not only earned for him the accolades uh, as the father of Italian literature and poetry, but certainly as an ordained deacon uh, places him squarely alongside the Eastern Christian tradition of a pantheon of great diaconal composers such as St. Ephraim the Syrian and St. Romanus the Melodist. And the greatest of these works is, of course, the Canticle of Creatures, which is regarded as one of the highest expressions of medieval, theocentric, and allegorical poetry ever to have been created. Now, after his vision at San Damiano and his call to rebuild the church, uh, he would later refer to his movement and companions in the huts at that little chapel of Our Lady Queen of the Angels, or the Portiuncula, or little portion, as the Jongleurs de Dieu, the jugglers of God, 
who were traveling performers, uh, joyful and socially critical jesters, acrobats and tumblers who were frequently paired with these singing poets in the troubadours, what became essentially a merry traveling circus. Uh, we can probably imagine sometimes their parishes functioning in a, in a similar way. Um, but St. Francis also frequently subjecting himself uh, because of this radical joy in the gospel <clears throat> uh, to mockery, derision, and misunderstanding by some of his contemporaries in Assisi. Here again, we see some resonance with the Russian Christian ascetical tradition of the Euro Divi, the Holy Fools for Christ. We might call to mind then the words of St. Paul to the Corinthians, quote, let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God, for it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness, and again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, and that they are futile. So let no one boast in men, end quote. <clears throat> one Russian uh, author notes, quote, the fool for Christ set, him, set for himself the ascetical task of battling within himself the root of all sin, <clears throat> which is pride. In order to accomplish this, he took on an unusual style of life, appearing as someone bereft of his mental faculties and bringing upon himself the ridicule of others. In addition, he exposed the evil in the world through metaphorical and symbolic words and actions. He took this ascetic endeavor upon himself in order to humble himself and to also more effectively influence others, since most people respond to the usual ordinary sermon with indifference. And the spiritual feat of foolishness for Christ was especially widespread in Russia, end quote. So here we see almost a prophetic charism in St. Francis uh, as that fool for Christ, very much in keeping with the Russian tradition uh, of asceticism. So in addition to the titles, the troubadours of the Lord and the jugglers of God and fools for Christ, uh, St. Francis would also call himself and his companions in this great movement of the Holy Spirit, the heralds of the great king. Royal heralds were messengers sent by kings and noblemen as emissaries to loudly deliver messages and proclamations. They would often be sent to a town or a city or a village before the arrival or advent of the king and his entourage, announcing the Evangelion, the good news or gospel of his arrival as king of the realm. And it's noteworthy that this role of herald and messenger sharing the gospel of Christ's arrival was attributed to both prophets and angelic powers in the scriptures, and then later to the ministry of the deacon, uh, who is often portrayed iconographically as an angelic power, and with the angels being portrayed iconographically in diaconal vestments. So deacons in the cosmic and heavenly court and liturgy of Jesus Christ, the royal high priest. Here we see our seraphic father, the deacon Francesco, truly as a messenger, an angelic messenger of Christ the King, announcing the good news of his advent and the gifts of his redemption offered to those who wed themselves to Lady Poverty and do penance in preparation for the great royal wedding feast of the kingdom to come. And so, my brothers and sisters in Christ and St. Francis, these three images, the troubadours of the Lord, singing the praises of Christ, his holy mother, our queen, the saints and the angels who form his heavenly court, as the jugglers of God and the fools for Christ who seek to live like apostles, the evangelical charisms of poverty, chastity, and obedience according to our state in life, and as heralds of the great king, <clears throat> announcing the good news of the advent of Christ and the true joy of cruciformity with him who reigns, crucified, resurrected, ascended in glory, and returning to us at the end of the age. In many respects, these three uh, titles of troubadours, jugglers, and heralds of the great king embody and shape the character of our Franciscan calling today in both the church and in the world. Like St. Francis and his companions, we are called to rebuild the church as troubadours, as jugglers, and fools for Christ, and heralds of the great king, so that it may truly welcome Christ the king and his eschatological return, his return first in the palace temple of our hearts and domestic churches through our royal priesthood and penance through prayer, fasting, repentance, and works of mercy. Second, in the palace temple of our parish churches through the worthy celebration of our Eucharistic liturgies, the divine praises of the hours, and a common life and apostolate. And then finally, in the temp palace temple of the world, of creation, the school, the marketplace, the public square, and even the halls of government. <clears throat> 
so that Christ, who is truly philanthropos in the Greek, which means the lover of mankind, and Pantocrator, the Lord Almighty, might reign supreme in all things with his holy mother, the Panagia, the All-Holy, the Theotokos, the mother and birth giver of God, and all the angels and saints in his holy council. In our Byzantine temples, we have before the royal doors of the iconostas, which is that icon wall <clears throat> that unites, doesn't just separate, it unites the nave and the altar area. This symbolizing the heavenly realm, two principal icons, that of Jesus Christ on the right, if you're facing the iconostas, and the Theotokos holding the Christ child on the left. <clears throat> Excuse me, these two icons, these principal icons, signify the two doors that are adjacent to them that open together, revealing the kingdom of the Holy Trinity and Jesus Christ. At one point in the liturgy, the deacon goes out through these doors with the holy gifts of the Eucharist, being, bringing them to the faithful and holding them aloft. Uh, he calls out to the congregation, approach with the fear of God and with faith to which the congregation responds, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The Lord is God and has revealed himself to us. We as followers of the great deacon of Assisi, St. Francis, are like the Byzantine deacon holding aloft the body and blood of Jesus Christ in the chalice, <clears throat> standing between these twin doors of Christ and the Queen Mother, holding the Christ child and, and calling aloud to the church and to the world, approach Christ, approach the kingdom of heaven, with holy fear of God and with faith. This is our calling in Christ as his disciples and followers in the footsteps of the Pavarello of Assisi, the troubadour of the Lord, the juggler of God, the fool for Christ, and the herald of the great king. Now, all of that being said, how does all this relate then to the second part of my talk, the gospel, the kingdom, and Franciscan renewal? We need to think about it in terms of these three roles of troubadour, juggler, and herald. As Franciscans, what is the song that we sing as troubadours of the Lord? What is the theme of our performance as the jugglers of God and fools for Christ? What is the message that we announce as heralds of the great king and his holy kingdom? In other words, what is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the king and his kingdom? And how do we proclaim it faithfully as Franciscans? And let me be clear, I'm not simply speaking as a Franciscan and a priest exhorting us to greater holiness, a lived witness to the gifts of faith, hope, and charity, according to the evangelical councils in our state and life. I'm speaking very specifically about the content of our song, the theme of our performance, the message of our announcement. Now, we throw out the word gospel and kingdom almost like cliches at times, like placeholders or substitutes for the creed, the life of Christ, his death, resurrection, ascension, although we see him sometimes skip over the, the ascension in, in that story, and his return in glory. But the word gospel, the good news, the evangelion, the message of Jesus Christ and his kingdom has definite content to it, and there is a specifically Franciscan way of proclaiming it. I would say that this Franciscan way of proclaiming the gospel has largely, tragically, been lost to us, not because of our lack of holiness, as important as holiness is to our calling and the calling of every Christian, and not because we have neglected to study the life words and the virtues of St. Francis and his companions, but simply because it is not taught to us. So it's my intention in the remaining portion of my, my time here to outline, however briefly, this Franciscan way of proclaiming the gospel of Christ and his kingdom, with the intention of exhorting us to learn this way, to learn this teaching, to meditate frequently on its implications for our life and our relationship with Jesus Christ, and to use it as a means of renewing our Franciscan mission in the life teaching, worship, and apostolate of the church. And when I talk about the Franciscan way of proclaiming the gospel, what do I mean? Here I am referring to the gospel of the universal and absolute primacy of Jesus Christ. Now, this is frequently referred to as the Franciscan thesis on the teachings of the motive for the incarnation of Christ, the divine reasons why the eternal Son of God took flesh and became a man 2,000 years ago, as taught especially by the great Franciscan theologian, blessed John Donscotus. John Donscotus, commonly called Donscotus, he was a late 13th century Scottish Catholic priest 
and a Franciscan friar. He was a university professor, philosopher, and theologian. His teaching on what became later known as the Franciscan thesis, in fact, has its roots that are not only Franciscan, but deeply biblical and patristic, spanning many centuries and regions, including the Latin, Greek, and Syriac streams of tradition. And here I would refer to you especially to the works of the 20th century Capuchin priest, Father Dominic Unger, and more recently, the writings of Father Maximilian Mary Dean, who is a Franciscan hermit and the founder of the website absoluteprimacyofchrist.org. Uh, my intention here is not to provide a comprehensive overview of the sources and the subject matter of the gospel of the universal and absolute primacy of Christ, but I want to at least help give an overview of this teaching, most especially in contrast to the alternative view on the motive or intention of the incarnation, which is most prevalent these days. And again, returning to our goal, the goal is to understand what is the song that we sing as troubadours? What is the theme of our, our show as jugglers of God and fools for Christ? And what is the message that we proclaim as heralds of Christ the King? <clears throat> so we are asking then the question centered around why did the eternal son of God become the son of the Virgin Mary? Why did God become man? What were the reasons or the motives for the incarnation of the son of God? And what are the implications of the answer to this question, both in terms of our faith and our salvation and our proclamation of the gospel, especially in a Franciscan key? This is not an inconsequential question. And as we'll see it relates directly to the announcement of the kingdom of God that is at the heart of the announcement of both St. John the Baptist and forerunner and of Jesus Christ himself. <clears throat> so let's look first at the common understanding of the gospel message. What do we mean when we talk about the gospel? Well, we could basically identify it in 10 key points. <clears throat> first, God in creation. God, the Holy Trinity, freely and gratuitously created the invisible and visible realms. The heavenly world of the angelic powers of the earthly world of human beings, animals, birds, fish, insects, etc. These were created to reveal the glory of God, his truth, beauty, and goodness. Okay, this is the first sort of pillar, if you will, of what we oftentimes hear as the gospel message. All very good and true, as we'll see. Then there was a rebellion in heaven. God invited the angels to participate in his glory, but one of the holy angels, Lucifer, rebelled against God out of pride, <clears throat> there was a war in heaven, and the devil and his minions were judged and exiled from heaven and cast down by St. Michael and the holy angels to the earth. The third pillar, the creation of man. In creating the man and woman in his image and likeness and placing him in the garden paradise with him, God called uh, man to exercise dominion over visible creation <clears throat> and to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. He gave man an original grace of innocence and, as, and a share in his divine life and love as his royal priestly and prophetic children. He gave them a command to avoid the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, since he and the woman will die in the, on the day that they eat of it. <clears throat> Excuse me. But then we have the temptation. Okay, so we start with God and creation, rebellion in heaven, then the creation of man, and, uh, or, and, and then we have the temptation. The devil appeared to the woman and the man in the form of a serpent and convinced them that the way to be like God is through disobedience, determining for ourselves what is good and what is evil. And then we have the fall through original sin. The man and the woman gave in to this temptation, revolted against God, and were banished in exile from paradise, suffering the effects of their sin, especially death. And the whole of visible creation, in a sense, rose up then against Adam, the image of God, who in his revolt against God, brought about a rupture in the created order. Sixth, salvation history begins. The fall and the promise marks the beginning of what we call salvation history as recounted in the Bible. Seven, we have the promise of a redeemer. <clears throat> in Genesis 3.15, the Proto-Evangelion, our first gospel, God promises that the seed of the woman would come and crush the head of the serpent. And this redeemer would be the solution to the subjection of humanity to sin, death, and the devil. Eighth, God's people of the covenant. God began a process of preparing humanity generally, and then later through the seed of Abraham, specifically in God's people Israel, to prepare for the coming of the Messiah who would save Israel and the world from sin, death, and the devil. 
Uh, this is seen especially in the covenants, the law, and the prophets. Ninth, in the fullness of time, Jesus Christ. Christ is born of the Virgin Mary as the Redeemer to rescue humanity. Being fully God and fully man, he reconciles God and man through the incarnation and offers the sacrifice of his life to conquer sin, death, and the devil by undergoing death on the cross and rising victoriously from the dead on the third day. He establishes and then commissions the church to share the gift of his salvation with the world. He ascends into glory at the right hand of the Father and sends the Holy Spirit upon the church to empower in it, it in its divine commission to proclaim Christ and to announce the gospel, to call humanity to faith and repentance and to make disciples of all nations through our faith, worship, and common life. And then finally, 10th, Christ's return in glory. Christ will return in glory. The dead will be resurrected and judged and the righteous taken into heaven and admitted to beatific vision, while the unrighteous will be cast into hell and soul and body, suffering torment with the devil and his fallen angels. Okay. These are the 10 points of the common gospel that we hear. God in creation, rebellion in heaven, creation of man, the temptation, the fall through original sin, salvation history beginning. We have the promise of a redeemer. The God's people of the covenant are formed and in the fullness of time, Christ comes and he will return in glory. These 10 points reflect that common understanding of most people uh, regarding the gospel as proclaimed by the church, the apostles, the martyrs, and the saints for 2,000 years. <clears throat> now, from a Franciscan perspective, we would certainly assent to all of these points. Uh, these teachings reflect the situation of humanity as created, fallen, and redeemed by Jesus Christ. But one thing that we would also note about this framework of the gospel is that the plan for the coming of Jesus Christ throughout the the uh, or through the incarnation seems to be treated exclusively as a consequence of sin. In other words, <clears throat> God made the world and called man to obedience to share forever in his divine life and love. Man sinned through disobedience, lost the grace of original innocence, lost the gift of immortality, lost life perpetually in the presence of God. Therefore, God had to send a redeemer to save humanity from the consequences of its fall sin, concupiscence, or as we refer to it in, in the Eastern tradition, the Adamic passions, death, and the devil. The coming of Christ and his incarnation, then, is seen as God's plan B. Plan A is no incarnation, because there would be no sin. Plan B is incarnation because of man's sin. Now, the argument of those in favor of the plan B approach is that God simply foreknew that man would sin and therefore had planned a rescue ahead of time in anticipation that man would sin. In other words, God predestined the coming of Christ because of his foreknowledge, his knowledge of the future. This approach is known as the Thomistic thesis after the great Dominican saint and theologian, St. Thomas Aquinas, although it is not entirely clear that he rejected the alternative thesis, the Franciscan thesis outright. But nevertheless, the Thomistic thesis is and has been the predominant way of approaching God's motive for the incarnation. This has been what has been announced uh, in, and it still continues to be announced uh, in the church today. <clears throat> God became man so that he could rescue man from sin, death, and the devil. And as St. Augustine essentially says, no sin, no incarnation. In other words, the greatest good in the history of the world the incarnation of the eternal son of God uh, and his human nature is entirely predicated or dependent upon the greatest evil in history of, in the history of the world, the original sin of the man and the woman. The Franciscan thesis on the absolute and universal primacy of Christ, on the other hand, while accepting pretty much all of the essentials of those 10 points I just listed, instead asserts that the incarnation in relationship to all other creatures was first willed by the creator as an end and as a good in itself. In other words, all creatures and even uh, the, the plan of redemption as well were ordained in a certain order in view of the glory of Jesus Christ, the God-man. <clears throat> it was not conditioned on the fact of man's fall. In fact, the whole created universe was willed for the sake of the advent of the eternal word becoming flesh at its predestined foundation. The incarnation was therefore, in fact, God's plan A. 
not plan B or C, but plan A, and was in fact wired into, if you will, the DNA of all creation, which would welcome him as its temple and throne. The principle that the world was created through the word for the sake of the glory of the incarnate word is also referred to as the universal kingship of Jesus Christ. The Franciscan thesis, therefore, offers something of a critique uh, that actually completes the full picture of why God became man. The advent of Christ the King and the Annunciation and Nativity is not, as we have been taught, just about welcoming Emmanuel, God with us, exclusively as the Redeemer of creation, but also we welcome him as the predestined King and the center of creation, the one for whom creation was made to welcome him. What is more, as we will see, the Virgin Mary of Nazareth was also at the same time predestined with Jesus Christ before the foundation of the world, as affirmed by Blessed Pius IX in defining the dogma of Franciscanism known as the Immaculate Conception. Jesus Christ then and the Theotokos, the Virgin Mary, were predestined in one and the same decree from God, which uh, occurred before there was a creation. And before there was a man, and there was a woman, and before there was the ancestral fall. In other words, the incarnation, God's plan A, was unconditional, uh, not conditional. As we'll see in just a moment, the problems here then with the Thomistic thesis are not so much what it asserts, that Christ came as a redeemer, which we certainly would affirm, but what it leaves out, that he was in fact the predestined king from before the creation of the world. And there are three scripture verses which help to bolster this conclusion. Uh, all of these are texts from the Apostle Paul, and they give an emphasis to the absolute primacy of Jesus Christ, this universal kingship, which directly calls into question the notion of the Thomistic Plan B thesis, which I detailed just a moment ago. Uh, these are Ephesians 1, 3 through 10, Romans 8, verses 28 through 30, and Colossians 1, verses 15 to 20. So let's briefly look at these, and here I want to mention that I'm using as a reference the wonderful little book, A Primer on the Absolute Primacy of Christ by Father Maximilian Dean, uh, which I referenced earlier. So Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 10, if you've got your Bibles, you can open them up and, and look at this particular verse. Quote, Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, and as he chose us in him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has blessed us in, his, in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth, end quote. And here I just want to highlight two quick things about this particular passage. There's much more that can be said, but just I want to highlight two points. In verses three through six, St. Paul says that in God's design, before the foundation of the world, he first predestines Christ to glory and then afterwards, he predestines the elect in himself as his holy adopted children to grace and glory. Secondly, in verse 10, St. Paul proclaims this mystery to reestablish all things in Christ, both in the heavens and the earth. This word reestablish in the Greek actually means to sum up all things. In other words, to sum up all things under the headship of Christ. Christ, through whom the world was made, is the head of both the heavens and the earth the angels and man, and all visible creatures. So this verse highlights the predestination of Christ to glory and our predestination in Christ before the foundation of the world. In other words, before the world was made, before there was a fall. And that we are also uh, to understand Christ as the head of all things, uh, that all creation is to be summed up in him. Uh, he was the one through whom the world was made, and both the heavens and the earth and the angels and man and all visible creatures uh, are reestablished in him, are established un under him and, and summed up in him. 
The next verse then is Romans 8, chapter 28 to 30, and I'll read this very quickly. Uh, quote, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified, end quote. And here again, we see this theme of the eternal predestination of Christ and all those who are in Christ. God's purpose or intention exists from all eternity. And he predestined Jesus Christ first, and then he predestined his elect in him so that he might be the firstborn of many brethren. In Christ, then, these elect of God, who are the brothers and sisters of Christ, are called from all eternity to be formed in the image of the Son of God. He is therefore the firstborn, not in time, but in the mind of God before the creation of the world, exercising the right to rule as the firstborn. Finally, we come to Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 20. Quote, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross, end quote. Now, this text is really seen as the classic text on the absolute primacy, the universal kingship of Christ. Here we see that Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God and the firstborn of every creature, not just man, but of all creation. Obviously, we're not speaking here in terms of chronological order. Jesus did not become incarnate until just 2,000 years ago, so long after the creation of the world. When we say firstborn, what do we mean? We mean that he is first in preeminence, first in God's intention in making the world. We mean that Christ has a royal primacy over everything that was made through him and in view of him. His excellence, his goodness, his grace and glory were absolutely at the heart of God's divine plan to create the world, inclusive of the angelic beings and of man. Here we see something that reminds us of the prologue to John's gospel. By him, all things were created to be whether angelic powers or human beings or the rest of material creation. He, Jesus Christ, the eternal word made flesh, is before all things, and he is preeminent in all things. Not only that he is the visible icon, not only that, but he is also the visible icon of the invisible God through his human nature. But he is also the first in God's intention in the way that he made the universe. The incarnate word, Jesus Christ, is the model figure, the archetype, if you will, against which and through which all of creation, all of created being was made and should conform. This is more than just redemption after the fall, although that is mentioned. It is also true of creation. God made the world visible and invisible with his divine son in mind and desired angels and men to reign with him and his universal kingship. Now, here, <clears throat> here the words of the subtle doctor. Blessed John Duns Scotus, uh, are instructive, quote, it can be said, therefore, that with the priority of nature, God chose for his heavenly court all of the angels and men he wished to have with their various degrees of perfection before he foresaw either sin or punishment, end quote. In other words, it's not as though God did not know that some of the angels and the whole of humanity was going to fall. Uh, but in his intention, his divine design, he was predestining his heavenly court, his divine council of angels and saints who would reign with, uh, with God through Jesus Christ the King. God made the world with Jesus Christ, philanthropos, lover of mankind, Pantocrator, the Lord Almighty, in view uh, of joining himself freely and lovingly and perfectly through Emmanuel, God with us, to the whole created universe and to give certain beings, angelic and human, a participation in this reign of divine love. Again, verse, verses 16 and 17, For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, 
visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So returning to St. Francis of Assisi, we know from his life and writings that Jesus Christ was the center of his life and his words and his thoughts. We also know of his fraternal closeness to the rest of creation as seen especially in the canticle of the creatures. Suddenly, creation, visible and invisible, is that throne room that welcomes Christ the King, and it is the primordial embodiment of the word incarnate that St. Francis loved so much that came in the fullness of time and joined himself to creation. Christ is truly then at the center of the world. And this intuition of St. Francis of Christocentrism at the heart of all created being is what informs the Franciscan thesis that developed first in the seraphic order, uh, his spiritual family. Uh, it is also what should inform our own evangelical calling to spread the gospel message to renew ourselves and the whole world in Christ. So how does this Christological metaphysic, if you will, this Franciscan thesis, which is more than just Franciscan, is affirmed in the scriptures, as we saw in the fathers of the church, affect the way we read the Bible and look at the history of salvation, especially in light of the 10 principles I initially shared. We can summarize uh, the Franciscan approach then, the Franciscan thesis, in eight key points. First, the incarnation was at the heart of God's plan for creation. God, who is love itself and abides in a loving union of three divine persons, in freely making the visible and invisible world, desired to unite himself fully to his creation. And this union with creation by the creator was not to be merely one of the creator ruling over and above his creation as a distant, if still benevolent king, but was to be through the creator taking on the nature of a creature, specifically man who would be the embodiment of God's kingship as Emmanuel, as God with us. God would bypass the pure spiritual nature of the angelic powers through this act of condescending love, uh, but would not go so low as to become simply an irrational creature that was material without a spiritual soul, but rather would join himself to man who embodied and mediated both spiritual and material being as an embodied spiritual soul. Man was created then to be the vessel for the incarnation of the word of God, joining to the Holy Trinity through his royal priestly mediation, all of the visible and invisible realms of creation. Christ the King was therefore the predestined center of his created kingdom. He is also the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end of creation, its origin and its goal. So he's the beginning, the end, and its center. From the very beginning before the creation of the world, God decreed and predestined that the second person of the Holy Trinity, the eternal word, would take flesh. And as we learn from the first 18 verses of the Gospel of John, when God created the world, he did so through his eternal word in view of his incarnation, the word becoming flesh, pitching his tent in our midst, if you will. This is what it means to speak then of the absolute primacy of Jesus Christ, the universal kingship of Christ. He was primary in the mind of God when he created the world through his word and his spirit, the two hands of the Father, as St. Irenaeus said. That's the first point. Again, the incarnation was at the heart of God's plan for creation. Secondly, <clears throat> the Virgin Mary was part of God's eternal plan. Before the visible and invisible creation took place, in the very same decree as uh, as uh, Pope uh, Pius IX mentions, uh, predestining Jesus Christ, God also predestined the creation of his most perfect creature, the Panagia, the All-Holy, the Theotokos, the Mother of God, who would share in the grace and glory of her divine Son and be the one through whom he would take flesh and share our human nature. Third point, the visible and invisible realms and creatures were made by the word in the power of the spirit as decreed by the father. God creates the heavenly realms of his kingdom for the angelic powers and the earthly visible realms for humanity. And of all material creatures, <clears throat> heaven and earth reveal the glory of God and the heavens as his throne and the earth as his footstool in the royal cosmic palace temple. God made the world through his word, his logos, who then imprinted on the world his words, his logoi, 
So the word creates the world, imprints upon it his words, which are the destiny of each created being within the kingdom of God, and heaven and earth were therefore at peace. God creates the world through his word. God imprints the words of the word upon created being, and all of these words have a destiny in the kingdom of God, uh, which is heaven and earth united together in peace. That's the third point. The fourth point, God created the angelic powers and revealed his divine plan to test their humility and obedience to his kingship and to his kingdom. So these spiritual beings were created through the eternal word of God to reflect in a created way his spiritual nature as God and would share in his divine life. <clears throat> they were to share in his life and in his rule as, and governance of created being as part of his divine and royal counsel. But they would need to undergo a test. He would disclose to them his divine plan for Emmanuel, for the advent of God with us at the heart of creation and the creation of the Virgin Mary as the Queen Mother. Now, these angels would need to adore then the incarnate word as God uh, and venerate and serve the Queen Mother in God's kingdom. Lucifer, who was in the highest order of the hierarchies of the angels, uh, rebelled pridefully against this plan that bypassed the created angelic powers and declared, non servium, I will not serve the God-man, and I certainly will not serve the Theotokos and the Queen Mother. And so he rebelled uh, against God and against the incarnation and God's plan and against the Theotokos, as we read about in Revelation chapter 12. And a third of the angelic powers joined him against God as a, and, and um, against God's holy angels in a war in heaven. Uh, St. Michael the archangel, whose name means who is like God, led the fight of the remaining two-thirds of the holy angelic hierarchy against the devil and his minions and banished them from heaven, casting them down to the earth. Now, in passing their ordeal, the righteous or the holy angels were saved through their ardent defense of the incarnation. Again, we see this reflected in Revelation chapter 12. Their ardent defense of the incarnation and of the Theotokos, uh, and their rejection of the rebellion of the other part of the hierarchy, and thus were saved through the grace of the incarnate Christ, never to suffer the loss of grace and glory in God, united to their nature and, and, uh, and their beings. They would forever remain the holy angels of God and would help to govern creation as part of God's holy and divine counsel. So this is an important point. God creates the angelic powers. He reveals to them the divine plan to become incarnate, to test their humility and obedience to his kingship and his kingdom. Some say yes, and some say no. And the ones who say yes become part of the holy angels of God, saved by the grace of the incarnate Christ. And those who say no um, are cast down uh, to the earth and are damned. God created, the fifth point, God created humanity then and revealed to them this same divine plan to test their humility and obedience to his kingship, to his kingdom. Uh, that the man and the woman were created in the image and likeness of God, and they were made as the children of God to be the king and queen, priests and prophets of God. They were created then to be the vessels through which the word would eventually take flesh through the Virgin Mary and fulfill the divine plan decreed from all eternity and be the son of God with his holy mother, the divine king and the queen mother, the high priest in the holy temple, the divine prophet and teacher and the prophetess handmaid of the Lord in creation. God revealed this plan to Adam and Eve uh, that their holy marital union would prophetically prepare the way for the union of the bridegroom and the bride in the incarnation and the church. This is alluded to in, uh, in the book of Ephesians. <clears throat> God desired that the man and the woman would share as vice regents in his governance over creation in the image of Christ the King and the Virgin Mary as the Queen as part of this divine council that would be made up of the predestined uh, angels and uh, and humans, uh, men, and, men and women, who would serve in this divine council of the great king. But the devil, in an effort to derail and to thwart this divine plan that he rebelled against, the divine plan of the king and his queen mother in the kingdom of God, took the form of a serpent dragon and went after the woman and tempted her uh, and through her the man to doubt God's holy command and achieve divinity 
uh, not by awaiting the incarnation, uh, not through obedience, but attain divinity through prideful disobedience. And he planted the seed then of a false word, a logismoi, a temptation as it's known in the Greek, outlining a path to a false theosis, a false deification. Man fell and ate in prideful disobedience. He lost participation in God's grace and glory, losing the garment of light, and would therefore be like a defrocked royal priest and be banished from the presence of God. <clears throat> Now, this, this is an important point. So the devil couldn't attack God directly, couldn't attack God's plan directly. So after being cast out of heaven uh, in exile by St. Michael and the holy angels, he then goes after the image of God. Can't attack God directly. He's going to go after the image of God. And he's going to attempt to derail God's divine plan for the incarnation, for the universal kingship of Jesus Christ. This brings us to the sixth point. This catastrophic act of disobedience on the part of, of the man and the woman, the original or ancestral sin, results then in a life of temporary exile from God's presence, from his glory, from participation in his glory. But God's divine plan overall, plan A, was not derailed by sin, but took on an additional redemptive character. So the devil thought that he had succeeded in derailing God's plan for the incarnation and the reign of Christ and for the creation and reign of his holy mother. And he fully expected humanity then to suffer the same fate that he and his demonic minions had undergone, permanent banishment from participation in the grace and the glory and the presence of God, thus making the incarnation impossible. This, this would render the incarnation and the queen mother and, and all of that impossible because uh, humanity had fallen. But what he did not expect was that God's mercy would triumph over our sin. Humanity was different from the fallen angelic powers who acted with full knowledge of the consequences of their rebellion and were tempted by no one, whereas humanity was immature, as St. Irenaeus of Lyon notes. They, they were destined to grow in knowledge and wisdom in time and were tempted and deceived by an outside force and a powerful force at that man and woman would still remain in God's image, even if the glorious likeness was temporarily lost. And as a result, when they suffered banishment from paradise, a divine promise was made that the seed of the woman would be at enmity with the serpent and would crush the head of the serpent. In other words, immediately after the fall, immediately after man and woman failed to repent, uh, St. Simon, the new theologian says that had but man and woman repented, uh, we would still be in paradise today, but they didn't repent. They blamed each other and the serpent. Uh, God's plan A, the incarnation of the Son of, in, in Jesus Christ, born of the Virgin Mary, would still take place as planned. This is what Genesis 3.15 is about. But it would take on a redemptive character. So the plan, God's plan A would have this added characteristic. It would still be God's primary plan, but it would have this added redemptive characteristic that this enmity would be a spiritual battle or warfare where the help of the holy angels, mankind would need to prepare the way for the coming of the Messiah, the seed of the woman who would come and finally crush the false dominion uh, of the serpent over the visible created order. Uh, and this would happen in humanity through prayer, through penance, through fasting and works of mercy as taught by the law and the prophets. So God has a plan. It's plan A. He's going to institute that plan, and he reveals that plan to the angelic powers. A third of them fall away. Two-thirds of them remain. They're saved by the incarnate grace of Christ to, to participate forever in his glory as holy angels. God reveals his plan to humanity. They are tempted by the serpent, and instead of trusting that God would eventually make uh, uh, a man or make the God man uh, and through the virgin queen, uh, instead they seek to take that upon themselves through sinful disobedience, and they inherit death. But God does not leave plan A. He, he takes what plan A is, and he adds a redemptive characteristic to it so that it's going to restore humanity uh, and eventually lead them into the fullness of glory because the incarnate word is going to take flesh, and we're going to be able to see and participate then in his glory. And the grace and glory would also be that uh, given and bestowed to the Theotokos, the Virgin Mary, as the Queen Mother. 
So then that brings us to the seventh point, Christ's advent through the fiat of the Virgin Mary, the yes of the Virgin Mary in the fullness of time, is at the heart of God's plan. And in her conception as the re representative of creation, she is the first beneficiary of his grace and glory. In the fullness of time, Jesus Christ the King would come in the womb of the Queen Mother through the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit. She was predestined from before the creation of the world, along with the divine son, to be the representative of creation to welcome the word of God in the power of the Holy Spirit through her yes, her fiat, which really defined her whole being as Panagia, the all-holy and immaculata, the immaculate one. Uh, this, th this yes to God was from her, the very first moment of her existence. Uh, he was the seed of the woman that would crush the dominion of the serpent by his incarnation and by undergoing death on the cross, rising from the dead and entering his eternal reign in glory. And she would be joined to him personally in these key moments of the, of the inauguration and realization of this kingdom. Uh, she was with him at the moment of the incarnation in her womb through the annunciation of the archangel Gabriel. She would bear in uh, bear him uh, to anoint John the prophet and forerunner in the womb of his mother Elizabeth and speak prophetically about Christ as the fulfillment of the aspirations and promises of Israel in the Old Testament. She was with him in his holy and humble birth at the nativity, receiving the adoration of angels and of man in both high kings and lowly shepherds. She was with him in his entry into the temple of God, being held in the hands of the Simeon the prophet, uh, foretelling her participation in his suffering and redemptive passion and death. She went with him into exile in Egypt, foretelling the universal mission of kingship and the gospel to the nations. She was with him in his hidden life in Nazareth. She was with him when he first began to be about his father's business, teaching in the temple, keeping all these things in her heart. She was with him in his first miracle and sign at the wedding feast of Cana. And she would accompany him in his public ministry and be with him and his disciples throughout. She was with him also along the way of the cross and with him at his crucifixion, offering her son and union with him to the heavenly father for the life of the world. And she was with him at his tomb and at the resurrection and his royal priestly triumph over death and conquering Hades on Holy Saturday. And she was there with him and his many appearances in the upper room. Uh, after his resurrection. She was there with him at his ascension into glory, as we see in many of the icons uh, of the church, his ascension into glory at the right hand of the father, his enthronement as the royal high priest. And she was in the upper room at the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit sent by her son on the apostles and disciples in the church, witnessing Peter's preaching and the conversion of thousands. She witnessed then the new conception and birth of the body of her son, the mystical body of her son, in the body of Christ the church. And she sojourned with the church and the apostle John for many years after the ascension, and then followed her son in a holy death at the Dormition in the upper room, being buried in the garden of Gethsemane and then being resurrected by her divine son, seated at his right hand to govern, uh, crowned with a crown of 12 stars and throne, and, and uh, as we hear about in Revelation 12, and having uh, being enthroned and, and having a glorified body and soul in the heavenly kingdom, serving as that prayerful intercessor for her spiritual children, those who keep the commandments of God and those who do battle against the serpent until her son's return in glory. In other words, she was with him in the inauguration of his kingdom, its establishment and his enthronement on the cross and in glory, and will be with him as the queen mother as its final consummation and revelation at the end of time. Finally, uh, Christ establishes his church then through the sending of the Holy Spirit to be that family of God's elect with the Virgin Mary as its queen mother. So she's there throughout his life and his, his suffering and his glorification. Uh, the church then is predestined to be joined then to God, the Holy Trinity, through the holy body of the new Adam as spiritual sons and daughters of the new Eve, and being born of water and the spirit, becoming partakers of his divine nature through grace and glory, given especially in the church and, and through the church's spiritual maternity as the image, if you will, of the Theotokos. Um, of, the, of the teaching of the faith and the cleansing and healing and feeding and serving of the holy mysteries, this vocation of the church uh, is not just only to be the body of Christ, 
but it is the new daughter Zion, the new mother of all the nations, the spiritual mother of all the nations in the image of the Holy Theotokos. Finally, this is my last point, Christ's return in glory, this is the eighth point, Christ's return in glory will be the consummation of God's redemptive plan for creation, joined fully uh, joined uh, to fully himself, excuse me, uh, God, God's plan for creation, uh, joined to himself in the temple of a new heavens and a new earth, governed by the spirit of God and his divine counsel, made up of the holy angels and the saints with Christ and his holy mother as king and queen of a new creation. This sinful world and the death and the devil will then be destroyed and recreated, the new world will be recreated as the center of God's fulfilled plan. Christ will truly then be the Alpha and the Omega, the center of all being now fulfilled and redeemed. Now, these eight points of the Franciscan thesis, the gospel, help to provide then a corrective, as you can see, to the rather one-sided Thomistic thesis, which places, if you will, an emphasis on the wrong syllable. Uh, the, the God had a, a plan B that was the incarnation. His plan A was no incarnation. Now, the Franciscan thesis says Jesus is not plan B of God's plan. He is at the very heart of God's predestined plan A. So when we speak then about St. Francis, we often say that Christ was the center of his life. And yet, can we not also say that he was also the center of his message of the gospel way of life? As he wrote in chapter 23 of his earlier rule, quote, therefore, let us desire nothing else. Let us want nothing else. Let us let nothing else please us and cause us delight except our creator, redeemer and savior, the only true God. And earlier he writes, let us all love the Lord God who has created, redeemed and will save us by his mercy alone, end quote. The call to penance, my brothers and sisters, is really a call to our vocation to be recreated in the image of of the image of God, Jesus Christ, our creator, our redeemer, and our savior, to be conformed to his grace and glory, which is our vocation by virtue of our election in him, and by our effort to throw off any sinful encumbrances to the participation in his grace and glory, in service to God, the gospel, and the kingdom, and to his queen mother, the Virgin Mary, who in him is also our mother, and our brothers and sisters in the divine council of the angels and the saints to which we have been called in Christ. This is the meaning of penance. It is to throw off the encumbrances so that we might fully reign with Christ in his universal kingdom. This is the great message of hope for renewal, not only in our Franciscan orders and societies, but in the Catholic church as a whole. It offers a truly fresh perspective on the meaning of life and its orientation, its fundamental orientation to Jesus Christ. So in conclusion, my brothers and sisters in Christ, the Franciscan thesis of the absolute primacy of Christ, his universal kingship over the whole of creation should be in imitation of our Holy Father Francis, the song that we sing as his troubadours, the theme of our show as the jugglers of God and fools for Christ, and the message that we announce as heralds of the great King. Praised be Jesus Christ, now and forever.